Our thoughts are based on what the Bible says and about how God sees the family unit and the things that he expects from the family unit. Some of what we're going to look at doesn't necessarily resemble what we see in families today. Quite a lot of it still does, actually, but some of it doesn't. And, and from our perspective, it, or, or from the world's perspective, that might appear to be out of touch with reality. That's not a problem to us, because we believe that God, through his spoken word and power, created all things. But the same word that was used to create everything was then recorded in the Bible to direct our lives, to support us in understanding our Creator and, crucially, in glorifying Him. So before we begin looking at obligations of those in the family unit, I just want to spend a couple of moments understanding that the family has always been at the centre of the way God works. For example, I'm sure you might know that God views the angels in heaven who work with and for him as his family. In tandem with that, he also views those on earth who do his will as his family. Well, those aren't my words. Those are words from the New Testament. Just come with me to Ephesians chapter 3. So we read Ephesians 6 a moment ago. But just come back to Ephesians chapter 3 with me. And let's see what the Apostle Paul says about these two families. We've got a number of quotations today, some of which I'll just put on the screen for you, others we might want to look at together. So in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 14, look, look at how Paul describes this. Ephesians 3 verse 14, for this cause, Paul says, I bow my knees unto the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So this is his idea, his unit. It's one family to God, marked by his family name. He is the Father. And a part of that family is in heaven, and a part of it's on earth. And his grand plan when Jesus returns is to bring those two parts together as the world is transformed so that everyone can be part of that one family. How do we know that? Well, we know that because the Bible tells us. Psalm 68, you can see it on the screen, verse 5, it tells us that God is a father of the fatherless, a judge of the widows. He is a God in his holy habitation. He setteth the solitary in families. And that word solitary there is the important one. Because in other places in the Bible, like Psalm 22, verse 20, that is also the word for darling. It's God's darling, his solitary one. And we know that his solitary one is the Lord Jesus Christ, God's only begotten son. And God has set Jesus in the families of those who make up the whole family of heaven and earth. That's why Jesus is so important. So if you're still in Ephesians, just come back to chapter 1 to see confirmation of this. One of the main themes of this little letter is that God is going to gather together his family. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9. I'm going to put the Revised Standard Version on the screen for you, but you should be able to follow it anyway. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 9. For he has made known to us all to us in all wisdom and insight the mystery of his will according to his purpose which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, look at this, things in heaven and things on earth. The two sides of the family are to be brought together through this solitary one, through his darling. God wants one extended family in Christ. And that doesn't mean that we have to be natural parents to be part of that family. Jesus wasn't a natural parent. He had no children of his own. Many of the characters that we read about in the Bible were not natural parents. Paul's another example. But in God's eyes, they are part of his family. So God considers himself a father to those two groups, a family in heaven and a family on earth. And one day soon, we hope and believe that those two will be brought together as one united family. 
Now, if we can understand those concepts, we ought to ask ourselves the question, or the next question, I suppose, which is, well, what does he expect from those in his family? For the angels, for the family in heaven, the Bible's very clear on, on what their obligations are. And Hebrews 1, verse 14 tells us, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? That's, that's one description of what the angels do, the family in heaven. They're actually there to help those of us who are in God's family on earth, which is you and me. That's quite wonderful really, isn't it? Because isn't that what families do? They help each other. Uh, do the angels do anything else? And the answer is, well, lots more actually. We haven't got time to look at all of it. But Psalm 103 tells us, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Bless ye the Lord, all ye his hosts, ye ministers of his, that do his pleasure. So we're given an abundance of information about what this family in heaven do. They listen to God's voice, they obey, they bring him pleasure, they carry out his commandments. <coughs> Those are just two examples of what the family in heaven does. So, so are there obligations then that apply to the family on earth? Because the angels are different to us, aren't they? Firstly, they're in heaven and they're immortal. You know, they have powers that we don't have. But are their obligations as part of one half of God's family any different to the obligations that you and I might have if we want to be part of God's family on earth? And I think it's interesting that, that Jesus has something to say about this because we know that one day there will be no difference. Just come with me to um, Luke chapter 20. So just, just back a few pages to Luke chapter 20. For many of us, we will know these words. But this is Jesus talking about when his kingdom is established on earth. Luke chapter 20, and he says in verse 35, But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, so he's talking about his kingdom, and he's talking about those from the family on earth who are eligible for this kingdom, he says, they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, neither can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels and are the children of God, being the children of the resurrection. So there's a picture there of the whole family of God gathered into one. We will be like the angels physically then. We're not like that today. And we're not organised as families in quite the same way today. Because we've read there that angels don't marry. They don't have children. They don't have the same nuclear family that, that we do. But they are still a family. And they have clear obligations and responsibilities towards God and towards us as members of the same family. So the family unit has always been God's idea. He is the father. And so we need to, to look at his idea of what the family is, not what we think it is, if we want to truly understand what the obligations are that we have as either parents or children, because we're all at least one of those two things, aren't we? But before we look at those obligations, let's just confirm why the family is so important to God. Why was marriage and having children the mechanism that he chose for family life in the Bible? Why didn't he choose the model that's similar to the angels? Why didn't he just put us into small communes? God could have made us more like the animals, so that men had several wives, or that wives had several fathers for their children. Now I know we see that today, don't we, anyway? But that's not what he intended. God, God could have chosen a number of ways in which to organise the world, but he hasn't. He's put us into family units. But we live in a world today that simply doesn't recognise or understand that that is what he did. God chose to do it this way for a very good reason. And perhaps it's the last book of the Old Testament, it's the book of Malachi, that gives us the clue. Just, just come and have a look at this. There are many reasons for families, but perhaps this is the most important one. Malachi chapter 2, 
the last book of the Old Testament and in verse 15. Malachi 2 verse 15, And did not God make one? Yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed? Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. And there it is. The purpose of families is to help ensure there is a godly seed, a godly family on earth. That's what he desires and that's what he wants. A godly offspring brought up by a man and a woman who are one. That does not mean that couples who don't have children are excluded from the family. It doesn't mean that individuals who never marry are not part of the family. Just the opposite, actually. Psalm 107, 40, uh, verse 41 tells us, He sets the poor on high from affliction, and he maketh him families like a flock. All the families that have God at their centre do form one huge family like a flock. And he is the shepherd. They are his family. He's made one. And that's what he wants. One from heaven, one from earth, brought together in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are invited to be part of that family by grace and through faith in that one. But we have to do certain things to be part of that family. We have to demonstrate that we have the right virtues and that we understand that there are obligations and responsibilities. So we've seen that the family unit was designed and ordained by God. And we now need to take a little look at the obligations that fall upon us as members of that family of God on earth. And the, unit in, and the family unit in God's eyes, a father, a mother and children, we call that the nuclear family, don't we? And around it, he set a wider family. Those that are also related, like grandparents and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters and cousins, etc. And for us as Christadelphians, we're blessed with another layer of family. Our fellow believers, it's what we call the ecclesia, brothers and sisters in Christ. It's still a family theme, isn't it? But it's interesting when we look at the world today and the families that we see, because they come, as we know, in all shapes and sizes. Very helpfully, the Office for National Statistics gives us the following information for 2021. It tells us there were 19.3 million families in the UK, up from 6.5% a decade ago. I suppose that's good news in a way. It tells us that 3 million, 15% of those families are single parent families. 12.7 million of those families have couples who are in a legally recognised relationship. And it tells us that there are 28.1 million households, not necessarily families, but households in the UK. Those who live alone has increased 8.3% in the last 10 years. Now we know that there are same-sex couples. We know that divorce rates are still high, that people swap and change partners regularly. We're not denying any of that. But what the data tells us is that the way God set up families with two parents to look after any children that come along is actually still largely true in this country today. And the UK government has a view on what parents should be doing in terms of obligations towards children. And here they are. This is the wording that comes directly from the government's website. This is the government's consideration of what parental responsibilities are. And those bullet points lay out what our society considers to be the most important elements of being a parent. And as a list of things to consider when being a parent, I think most of us would agree those are all important. And there's a couple at the back of the hall who are starting to think about that in reality. But the interesting thing, I think, is that that list in many respects actually has its origins in the Bible. So what we have are families today who resemble the structure of the family that God ordained and wants 
i.e. we have two parents to look after children, because practically it works really well. But the key difference is that the vast majority of those families do not bear God's name. And they're not considered part of his family on earth. So what are the things that make an ordinary family also a family that belongs to God? And we're going to just focus on these four elements for a few moments now to show how these responsibilities are the correct ones, but why they're the correct ones from the Bible's point of view. So we've got to start out by saying the Bible's not a a day-by-day list of instructions on how to raise children if you're a parent but it has got plenty of advice about the principles that need to be followed. We've already established that families have been created to help ensure there's a godly seed. And the Bible's very clear that there are blessings that come with doing that. Just come with me to Proverbs, if you would. Proverbs chapter 23. Many of us will know these words, but um, it's important we remind ourselves of the blessings that God has set in families if it's done correctly. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 24. It says, The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. There it is. There's the importance of having a godly child or godly children. It brings joy and rejoicing for God and for the parents if that child is brought up in the way the Bible recommends. That's the motivation here. God wants a godly seed and creating one brings benefits to the parents as well as to God. But if that's true, then then so must be the opposite. And and on this slide, you can see that is the case. We've all seen that face before, haven't we? But in Proverbs 17 and verse 21, it tells us, He that begetteth a fool doeth it to his sorrow, and the father of a fool hath no joy. And in verse 25 of the same chapter, A foolish son is a grief to his father, and bitterness to her that bear him. So we have to understand this. God places obligations on parents to appreciate the spirit of the Bible's guidelines and to work together for the benefit of the children. After all, they are only children for a brief period of time. It doesn't feel that way sometimes, but it is only a brief period of time. And it won't be long before they are set as who they're going to be when they grow up. Perhaps we can sum this key obligation up in the words that we read earlier. Just think about what we read in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. Paul said there, didn't he? Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So the first responsibility we have is to bring our children up with God at the centre of the family. That is no surprise, given what we've seen already, given that God ordained the family and is intensely interested in bringing two, two families together in his son. And what was true in the New Testament for Paul, in Ephesians it was true, but it was true much earlier in history. Just come with me to um, Deuteronomy, the fifth book of the Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 6. Paul's not presenting a new idea to us in the New Testament because the idea was there much, much earlier in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. What does it say? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou wakest up by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. The first obligation then for parents is to ensure the environment is right, so that any children can be positively influenced by the things of God. The word teach there in verse 7 means to sharpen, And the idea here is that it's a process. It takes time and effort. And without that effort, you will not shape the child as you need to. It's a gradual thing our children do as they grow and change and learn. So the right environment. 
The right home and structure in a godly sense is absolutely key. The UK government guidance told us that providing a home and protecting and maintaining children is the key and the first responsibility. The Bible says the same thing. But the difference is that the home must have God at its centre. And it's as much about maintaining the spiritual and godly environment as it is about maintaining for the physical side of the children's lives. It's a battle of balance to ensure that the conversations we have with our children are layered with principles relating to God. It's about sowing into their young lives divine principles so they have an appreciation of what is godly and what is right. It's an obligation to teach our children an eternal life skill, along with all the normal life skills that they'll need to survive naturally. It's an eternal life skill which elevates them above all other children so they can grow into a life of purpose and meaning today. So it's about forming an environment that has a glorious prospect of the life that is truly life when the family in heaven and the family in earth are brought together eventually in Christ. So the next element, having covered the first two, is interesting because it's a word that people today don't often like the sound of. It's the word discipline. The UK government guidance rightly says that parents should be disciplining their children. It's one of the most vital elements of parenting. As human beings, we're the only creatures in the universe who have the power of free will. That free will, sadly, left to its own devices, nearly always runs contrary to what God wants. That the world around us sees the need to guide and discipline children, but the same is absolutely true when it comes to discipline in order to be part of God's family. And the quality of being able to discipline children and keep them heading in the right direction was something that was recognised by God in one of the most faithful men in the Bible. If you're in Deuteronomy, just come back to the beginning, to Genesis chapter 18, the first book of the Bible, chapter 18. See what God says about Abraham. Abraham, as we know, was the father of the, the nation of Israel. So let's see what it was that God saw in Abraham that made him such a great father. Genesis chapter 18, and look at verse 19. God says, for I know Abraham, I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Abraham understood the obligation of discipline. God knew it, he could see it. And it's the same quality that parents need to show today. The word command there seems to be quite a strong one, doesn't it? But to show discipline, parents need to be strong. They need to be fair, they need to be loving as well with it, but disciplining children is actually one of the greatest things we can do for them. Parents with support from the wider family and our ecclesia, the community of believers, need to show the importance of being disciplined in the things of God. It actually shows love, doesn't it? Proverbs 13 says this, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. In, in Hebrews 12 we read, <clears throat> Have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children? My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Verse 9 of Hebrews 12 reminds us that if that's done correctly, there is a positive impact. Look at what it says at the bottom of the slide. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Now, we're not standing here necessarily condoning the smacking of children. The principle here is that at times being disciplined was and is required. When it happened to us, it wasn't our happiest moment. It's not a happy moment for parents to have to do it. 
But the Bible's clear, it's an absolutely essential obligation for the family of God. God himself uses it as our parent, no matter how old we are. The key thing is that we realise that discipline is necessary for the development of children. It is the only way to help them exercise their free will in line with God's principles. We cannot just leave them to their own devices. What is crucial from the Bible's point of view is that it's, in, in disciplining, we are positive, we are consistent, and that it comes from parents who themselves are living by the standards they expect to see from their children. So the final element here that we want to take from the government's list is around a child's education. We know that education is a, is a huge thing in today's world. The Bible's also clear. It's something that parents need to make sure happens in a godly sense. Getting this right does shape a child for life. Proverbs 22 verse 6 tells us, doesn't it? Train up a child in the way he or she should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it. You know, more than half of our children's time in their formative years are spent with their parents as the primary carers and teachers. So how best to use that time? It's more than just about reading Bible passages, isn't it, and explaining their meaning. Because if you think about school, we don't just teach English, maths and science. There's a bit more to the curriculum, isn't there? It's more balanced than that. So one key thing parents must do is show spiritual guidance. The sort of guidance that touches and influences all parts of a child's life. Not just when we're focused on reading God's word after dinner, for example. One very, very key thing is that our children learn how to talk. We're all keen to hear them talk. But we must teach them how to talk to God. And we know that we do that through prayer and prayer alone. So praying with our children is a real obligation as part of their education. It's as much a part of life as reading the Bible is. This was something that, again, recognised thousands and thousands of years ago. Just come with me to the New Testament, to, to Matthew chapter 19. It was something that was you know, understood by Jesus himself and the people of his day. First book of the New Testament, Matthew chapter 19. And in verse 13, what does it tell us? Matthew 19 verse 13, Then were brought unto Jesus little children, that he should put his hands on them and pray. And his disciples didn't like that. They tried to, to shoo them away. They, they saw them as a nuisance. But look at Jesus' reaction in verse 14. But Jesus said, Suffer, little children, forbid them not to come unto me. For of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and departed thence. Children are absolutely critical to the purpose of God. Jesus himself said so. They're the future, aren't they? They are always the future. They need time and attention. And they need to know how to talk to God. So parents praying with their children is educating them from a young age about the relationship between God and the family of believers. It sets the example in the early years of a child's life that this family that they are in is different. That there is a close relationship with a divine father who cares for his family. And that talking to this heavenly father is something that's expected and something that brings benefits. So I'd suggest those key obligations for parents are, are all correct from God's point of view, but they also happen to align to what the UK government thinks parents should do. The key difference is that for most families there is no godly element going on. It's not godly things that are driving their obligations to their children. But it's an utterly vital difference that we need to have. So very quickly then, what are the obligations of children? Parents have got very, very clear responsibilities. What about children? Well, I've tried, if the children are listening, to make this as simple as I can. The UK government 
doesn't have a formal view on what children should do. You can't find one. There's no corresponding list that I can show you about how children should behave. There's no comment. But we have just seen, haven't we, from Matthew 19, that children are a vital part of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says so. We know that they have free will. We know they can make choices. We know that they can bring their parents joy or shame. So what is it that children need to do? Well, perhaps we can sum these things up with four R's. And maybe these are steps as much as they are obligations. Firstly, respect. To use another word, honour. We read it in Ephesians 6, didn't we? Honour your father and your mother. It all starts with respecting your parents as the authority in your life. Respecting your mother and father demonstrates you can also respect God as your heavenly father. It means you recognise and respect the principle of his parenthood. Exodus 20 lists the commandments that the children of Israel had to follow. And this is one of them. That's how important a principle it is to God. Honour your father and mother. Respect the weight that they bear in your life is what it means. The next one is to read. Reading the Bible. Read the scriptures daily. I would say that's an obligation, or it's a step that you certainly need to be moving towards, of your own accord, not because your parents just want you to. And that should never stop when we get to be older or grown up. Developing the habit of reading daily starts when we are young. You can see the words quoted there from 2 Timothy 3. Paul speaks to his son in the faith, Timothy. And he says to him, continue in the things which you have learned and have been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And only through reading the Bible can you get to know it. And in knowing it, gain the assurance and the wisdom that leads to the third R. And that is the word realisation. It's not simply enough to read and to know what the Bible says and to just respect your parents. Understanding the Bible places an obligation on us as children to come to a realisation. And the realisation that God is looking for is something that this world doesn't recognise. It's the realisation that something incredible has been done for us and we aren't worthy of it. Just come with me in the New Testament, further on to 1 Peter chapter 3, towards the end of the New Testament, come past Hebrews, 1 Peter chapter 3. And look at this as a verse to explain to us the enormity of what has been done. 1 Peter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. That's the realisation that God wants you to reach. There's a realisation that God's family in heaven and his family on earth is going to be brought together because of one perfect man's actions. It's realising that we are unjust. And that because he was just, and because of his voluntary sacrifice, we are justified in him. And that realisation leads us to our fourth and final R. And that is that there must be a response. The respect we show to our parents and God, the reading we do, and the realisation we arrive at, must bring about a response. That required response is found a bit later in that same chapter in Peter. 1 Peter 3, verse 21. The like figure, wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the response. Baptism into the saving name of Jesus who has been resurrected. So let's summarise our thoughts. We've seen that God is intensely interested in families. 
He has one in heaven, his angels and his son. He has one on earth, made up not of all mankind, but a generation throughout time who believe in him and have been faithful. His absolute intention is that those two families will be united together one day through the Lord Jesus Christ. We've seen that the angels have roles and responsibilities. It's the same for parents, to a lesser extent, children. The world around us unknowingly recognises the wisdom of the family unit, but they are not guided by godly principles. The world recognises parents have key obligations which are very close to what the Bible teaches, but they do not see those obligations in relation to a godly life. But we've seen from the Bible that there's an absolute duty to God, that parents must love and care for their children. It, it's, it is the most important role that God asks of us as believers. It also happens to be one of the most difficult. The truth is, there's only ever been one perfect parental relationship. That's between God and his son, the Lord Jesus. And that's the example that we're asked to follow. Now we can't ever hope to match that relationship, but we are obligated to try. It's true that every generation of parents down through time has had a difficult task in raising their children in the ways of God. I think it's made even harder by the society and the age in which we have today. But the principles of God's family, though old, still stand true. The obligations remain the same. Let's just end with one final quotation from Proverbs in chapter 27. And perhaps this sums up the, the challenge of being in God's family and the importance of meeting those obligations. Proverbs 27 and verse 23. And I'll put the Revised Standard Version um, verse on the screen. It says this, Proverbs 27, verse 23. Know well the condition of your flocks and give attention to your herds. For riches do not last forever and does a crown endure to all generations. Maintaining the godly family unit is what we must do as parents and children and brothers and sisters in an ecclesia. Focus on more than the riches of this life. Doing that is the only way we can make sure that we and our children receive the eternal riches of a place in God's family forever.